Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Bulletproof for BJJ podcast. Now, today we are talking about the five things I wish I knew as a white belt. Uh, this is the, the common thing that people get partway through their journey and they're like, man, I wish I knew that ages ago. And uh, this is actually uh, a topic that was brought up by one of our Bulletproof fam. And uh, we've got a few things to dig into today. And the first on the list, Joe, is injury. So I thought we would, we would go to you with uh, a, your, an injury that really informed you in your jiu-jitsu. Yeah, well, I guess when I signed up for JITS, no one ever really told me that you are going to get a whole bunch of little, you know, little niggling injuries and then maybe some bigger ones along the way. And so it's just kind of this unspoken thing that um, you find out about on your own. And then when you get there, it's you kind of, you're left in the lurch because it's like you got to go find a physiotherapist or you go find a doctor or, you know, someone who can help you fix it. Um, looking back, if the coach had said to me, Hey man, uh, this is this is a pretty full on contact sport. Chances of, of uh, an injury happening are kind of high. So just so you know, if it happens, come talk to me. I've got a good physio in the local area, or you know, so and so who trains with us can help with that. Like just a little bit of outreach, kind of before the fact, um, that would have helped a lot. Yeah, definitely. I think it, even though obviously I, we were talking about this the other day uh, about the kind of jujitsu mental superiority of like oh. We do jujitsu. We're smart. Most sports. Do we say that? Well, no. I think there's a, a thing which is, oh, people do jujitsu. They're tough. You know, they're not. They're, we are not meatheads. But this is actually not true. There's a very unprofessional approach to the way we approach jujitsu. Yeah. And like even football clubs have physios. That's right. Right. And 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 most major sporting organisations will have a link to some kind of therapist, even a massage therapist, anything like that. Jiu-Jitsu doesn't. And the amount of like bro science, silly, outdated methods, which, uh, you know, like uh, when I, I, I injured my ribs and I had guys like, oh man, you just got strap it. And like, <laughs> no, if you hurt your ribs, there's actually nothing you can really do. Even you got to rest. You, you got to rest. Yeah. It's one of those things that puts you on hold. But I had three very expert mat opinions, which had nothing to do with reality. So when I actually did get to see somebody who was like, what are you doing bandages around your ribs? <laughs> like every time you breathe, you know, your rib cage is going to expand and your ribs going to pop out and you're just going to have to really take it easy. I, I remember um, the, with the injury thing, yeah, you, you know, it's uh, the, the, the thing with JITS is like, oh, look, just take it easy, but keep training. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck does that even mean in, in, in this sport? Because like- Oh, you're going to roll, you know, the coach, of the, and I've seen this. I see this play out regularly. Someone's got an injury. They've had some time off. They come mm. back to training. Coach's like, how you going? Yeah, it's pretty good, but, you know, the injury's still kind of there a little bit. Okay, just take it easy tonight. And then they take it easy, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> and then they're like, all right, guys, we're rolling. And they're like, hey, injured guy, you're going to roll? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm feeling pretty good. It's like, no. okay, just take it easy. And it's like, what the fuck does that mean, take no, it easy? Like, it's, uh, we all know as soon as you get into a role, it's, it's, it's on. It's on, right? Like, I mean, maybe it's not on until the other person tries to, to tap you. Yes. Then it's fucking on because yes. this is, we'll go into this later, but this is the ego piece. So, the, yeah, they're just like, I think coaches turned a blind eye to it as well. And it's yeah. like, I don't want to acknowledge your injury. We're all having a good time. Let's just train. Yeah. And, and you know that you can usually get through a session and the pain is masked by the adrenaline. The adrenaline, yeah. Not till after, and then you know. So it's just, yeah. The injury thing is really poorly addressed, and I really would have liked if someone had said to me, "You're going to need to figure out a system to manage this," mm. uh, and that system looks like a bit of strength and mobility, having some good specialists and health professionals that you can mm. see, and people you can go to for advice. Agreed. I think if you're going to rally drive, you need a mechanic. Spot you on. Know, you know, we are we are like we are reasonably expert at looking after our own rigs but there are things that are outside our field of knowledge. So then we've got to go to someone who's specialized to help us. So I, I'm very lucky that I have friends who are physios and you, you would experience that too. Well, they've become my friends. They've become, <laughs> I hang out a lot. Yeah. You befriend them, you get the mates rates, cheaper, yeah. cheaper mates. Well, we just fuck, I'm there all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're just hanging out with them because you're so banged up. But uh, truth is uh, you need to find a good therapist because they're not all great. Sometimes you're going to go to a therapist and they just don't know what you're talking about you at least need to speak to someone who 
can conceptualize what you're talking about and, and relate it back to your rehab process, bringing you back to a level of function that's going to get you rolling again. So for me, I, I feel like that took me a little while, but once you find those people, they're gold and you need to hang on to them. So that's the key thing for me, take away from injuries, get a good body mechanic consultant. Part two, what have we got? Oh, we've got ego. Your ego. Your it's ego is not your amigo. No, <laughs> no, it is not. That's a good one. That should be a hashtag. Um, I think I actually heard that from, uh, what's his name? Keenan. Oh, true. Fortunately, shout out Keenan. Thanks for watching. Yeah, Keenan, appreciate you, man. I mean, uh, much love. Uh, what's the, um, you know, like ego is a big one, right? Where does, where, JT, where do you think the ego comes into your experience of jiu-jitsu the most? Being too competitive. So just going to your A game all the time. I'm good at this. I always get sweeps from here. I always tap the guy from here. I'm just going to do this. Not like, because we all know that feeling of sucking when we first start jujitsu, but once you've been in jujitsu for a while and you get a bit of a feel for what works for your body and what you like, your game, you go, right, I'm going to cultivate this because no one likes the feeling of being smashed. No one. It doesn't matter who you are. You want to feel you're in control, you have knowledge, you have skill, and you want that esteem of someone going, man, you're really good at X, Y, Z. Whether or not you're into internal or external validation, like we all want to feel like we have a degree of control within this chaos, which is BJJ. The only problem with that is people tend to do the same thing over and over and over again. And that's okay from a competitive standpoint, because yes, in competition, you've got to have that A game, but really jujitsu is massive. And if your goal is to be a black belt and your goal is to also possibly teach, you do need a slightly broader knowledge base. And really, for me, uh, the perfect example of this is when Birambolo got popular and I'd just gone back to Brazil my second time and I was like, I just want to learn this thing. I, like, I was just like, I just want to know it. People are doing this thing. I have no idea what's going on here. I just grabbed the guy who was doing it. And I was like, dude, can you show this to me? Like, can you teach me whatever? I just want to understand what the hell is going on here because th the thing for me which I find worse than sucking is not knowing why I'm sucking. <laughs> I, I'm okay to suck if I can comprehend this is why and here's the path out. And ego really, I've seen it hold more people back than even myself because I, I, I actually, as a masochist, I'm happy to go to sucky spots and hurt there. How about yourself, man? Has, has ego affected your jiu-jitsu or anyone you know? Yeah, definitely. What you, know, what you said there rings true for me in a big way. Um, another place where I can see ego playing out is just like, how it can affect, you know, my ego is almost like my perception of myself and how that can affect my training experience. Mm. So I can think back to like when I was um, a blue purple belt training a lot more intensely and a lot more competitively. And I had, I remember there was another guy, shout out to Bean, uh, Aaron Bean, who was, uh, we were counterparts mm. and, and he was, this guy's an animal. He's the strongest cat I've ever rolled with. Um, which is ouch, man. Yeah, which is a big call. I know, dude. Oh, I shame, know. shame on me. I know. And uh, <laughs> who and is this he, guy? I want to find him and kill him. <laughs> and he, um, but but I, I I know that like there were times at training where I was like, I don't want to go into a role with him because it's going to be so intense and I might lose. That I would not. We would not train with each other that night. Mm. And it was like looking back, it's like well, we could have learned so much by just training with each other. Even if I got tapped like you know ten times in a round, like it doesn't matter. There's things to be learned there. And so, but it really, it was just this kind of thing in my mind, and I'm sure he had it as well, where it, it, you don't want to go to that place because you know when you get there, you're going to be competitive. Yep. And you're like, I don't want to experience whatever that is, that intensity or that, that low of failure in a training room. So I'm going to avoid it. And looking back, you're like, that's really silly. You shouldn't let that affect you, you know. So there has to be an acknowledgement. I don't think you can fully detach yourself from your ego, but I do think that you want to be as aware of it as you can and be making sort of inroads towards uh, controlling it and not letting it control you as much. Yeah, I, I had that experience with Ben Hodgkinson. Shout out, you tall, lanky, mulleted mother. Also just got his first stripe on his black belt. Congrats. His mullet looks great at the moment. It's furious. He even got posted on a, a jiu-jitsu, haircuts of jiu-jitsu. Oh, damn. Wow. Yeah, if only you'd kept yours, Joey. I know, I you, fucked up. You could have made it. Um, we were very intense competitors through Purple. 
that whole year we fought nine times. I think I only beat him once, maybe twice if I'm lucky. But he would always beat me uh, generally. But we ended up being teammates. And it was funny because we would – it was never a light roll. It was always to the death. Um, and, and to be honest, Ben would get the better of me until we hit a critical point where I was like, oh, I'm fitter than him. So I started making it more of a fitness role, less of a jiu-jitsu role, because I knew the way for me to win was on my cardio and on my strength and just – just make it a physical battle more than a technical battle because he's actually more technical than me. Uh, but then that I didn't get the best out of him. Even though I would win some roles, it was kind of a bit muted because I didn't actually beat his jiu-jitsu. And then when I said to him, hey, man, I can help you be stronger. I can help you be fitter and more flexible. He's like, really? You want to give me that? I'm like, yeah, man, because you, you'll be better than me. Like, take it, you know? And then we actually became friends after that because he could see that I was willing to share with him. And, but there were times when we would, you know, when you look to someone to roll, you're like, oh, hey, man, you're like, kind of give them the, what's up? And they're like, look away. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, thank God they looked away. <laughs> <laughs> you you kind of didn't want to roll them, but you were like, I don't want to, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the bitch in the situation. <laughs> but, but there were times when we were both maybe not feeling it. And we'd almost duck each other because of that intensity exact and that same thing. ego. Yeah. And uh, definitely I think we wasted a good two years of not not embracing learning from each other. Yeah. And that's where ego probably held both of us back. But um, point three, jujitsu jealousy, comparison. This is where it's uh, – this is where uh, big problems, I mean in life in general, um, but definitely I've suffered from – jiu-jitsu jealousy and uh i think this is a thing that we do it subconsciously where we kind of mark ourselves against our cohort like oh i've been training for a year he's been training for a year man that guy's got four stripes i've only got two what's that about man this guy just got his purple belt i kick his ass all the time oh what's with her she's always submitting everybody but who she thinks she is you know like and really the issue here is that you you're not really focusing on your own insufficiencies which is what's really holding your jiu-jitsu back. And the people who excel are generally working on their deficiencies all of the time to, to improve. And they're chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, constantly improving. And I find that when I look to others, I'm distracted. Yeah, I'd agree. I think um, something that's, that, that's really relevant about this for white belts, people who are early on in the jiu-jitsu journey, is that when you start, and you know, this is really... Um, this is poignant for me because like I got my son who's almost three months old. So it's like, you know, we talk about this, right? Imagine he's when he's one week old that like a whole day is like a seventh of his life. So mm. a whole day is very long, but as you get older, a day becomes worth less and less. Right. So for us now we've had thousands of days, one day's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a blip on the timeline. Um, when you are, you're like a baby, right. And, and, yes. and, and a stripe or, training for a couple of weeks is 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 the equivalent of a day for you so you start jiu-jitsu at the same time there's a few other people that start at the same time you're on this journey together you get a stripe they get a stripe maybe it happens at the same day it's beautiful you know you you learn techniques together you're kind of counterparts but for whatever reason something gets in the way you have to take a couple of weeks off because you catch a cold or fucking you go on holidays or whatever it is you come back and all of a sudden that person's just jumped up a little bit Yes. You know, and then maybe for whatever reason, more time passes, that person starts to compete more and you don't because you, be, you work on weekends, you know, whatever it is. But because you're always going back to that, oh, but, but James and I are the same level and James has now got two stripes and James is, you know, like you, and, and what you got to realize is that that's going to happen. Like that, that as you get, as this timeline increases, you are just going to fall in and out of alignment with all of these different people. Then there's, you know, eventually there's going to be one day when, when you are dominant over someone who's a higher belt than you. And you're like, well, how the fuck do I explain that? Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's just yes. what it like. And, and I think once you get to, I realize this now at Brown belt, cause I've been Brown belt for a fucking long time, five mm. years or whatever. I've realized that like, I've seen people start jujitsu when I had my Brown belt who now have a brown belt. Wow. Right? I've seen people who were, uh, who we were blue belts at the same time, who got their black belt before I got my brown belt. Wow. Like, and so, you know, if you, if you think about it like that, it's like, 
you have this kind of thing where we're on this same level together in the very early days. Once you've been in the game for a long time, you just realize you've got to let that go. Yeah, definitely. And I used to be, when I first started as a white belt, I used to think if you could tap, if you could submit someone who was a higher belt than you, then you were as good as them, which is not true. Like submitting someone can be opportunistic. Like if you've got a flying armbar, like I, I, I know a blue belt who has an insane flying armbar, could probably flying armbar pretty much anyone, except I know that he does it. So I just, <laughs> I just pull my arms in real tight. Um, that doesn't mean his jujitsu is any good. Like he, his, con- his concept of jujitsu, his understanding is not high. It's like a guillotine or a footlock. It's not technical. But I used to think to myself, man, if I, can, if I can tap that blue belt, you know, I should be a blue belt. But in truth, I have, and this is not a brag, this is just circumstantial, I submitted a black belt world champion. But he was exhausted. He had trained for two hours before I trained with him and he was rolling with me for a rest round and I came at him like hell fury. And he just gave it up because he was like, you know, I don't want to get my arm broken and it doesn't make me a world champion doesn't make me as good as him it just means he had enough humility to go i'm exhausted and okay fine but me i'm like yeah so good i'm the best and it's just not true <laughs> you're looking at the coach like where's my black belt where, where am i at where's, where, where where's my medallion <laughs> son i need that world championship bling no it's it's ridiculous to think this and actually what i have learned now is that there are levels to each belt when so <laughs> Joey Joey goes in a competition, you know, he's a brown belt and some guy's just got his brown belt. He's super fresh, sees Joe five years, wants that black belt, has come for blood and is an athletic he's monster. To a point. And this guy's just like, Yeah, man, I'm a brown belt. Yeah. He's gonna get eaten alive. You know, there's a difference there. In the same way, you get somebody who's been a black belt for 15 years. You step on the mat and you're like, oh, this guy looks kind of old, like whatever to the old boy. Dude will snap you up like that because you have to appreciate people's commitment to this art can be deeper at all levels from white through to the top level belt. As long as you are reaffirming your commitment and your own development, um, that whole idea of the comparison is, it's kind of useless because you don't know what they're doing. You honestly don't know all the stuff they're doing to be as good as they are. And what they need to do to get better may be very different to what you need to do to get better. And that's where I feel the comparison thing doesn't help. Yeah, that's right. There's that great quote, comparison is the thief of all joy. Yes. And, you know, it's important to use it. It's, it's important to compare yourself to yourself. It's important to compare yourself to training partners, right? Like a simple comparison I fuck, you know, JT swept me with that same sweep three times last week. Okay, tonight I'm going to try and shut that sweep down. Like that, that is a healthy use of comparison. But to come into the training room every time and be like, oh, there's so-and-so, why are they better? You know, it's, it's the wrong way to look at it. What you want to look at is, all right, what do I need to do to get better? And, um, you know, you, you, can, you can really also make that argument that if your training partners are pushing you and if they're getting better, then you are also getting better, yes. right? So it's, it's like... Compare, but don't let that thing get in the way of you having a good time and improving your game. Yeah, agreed. And I, I, I think this um, leads us into something which is pretty important, which is, um, which is overtraining. Because you want to work harder, and there is a myth within jiu-jitsu. It's not even a myth. I think it's something which is talked about. It's, it's at meme level now, which is poor harder, everyday poor harder. And Some, one of our fans... One of our people that listens and follows Bulletproof said to me the other day, well, man, what's, what, what's this word that you're at? Por, porada. I, yeah, porada. And I was like, ah. you are a white belt, aren't you? Yeah. yeah time will come, young man. <laughs> and I turned my back on him and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> just what, Someone what, just leave you with that. What does porada mean? So porada is actually, if you guys are watching like a sporting event, like a whatever it might be, footy, baseball, ice hockey, and a fight breaks out and dudes are just wailing on each other. That is porrada. Now, porra is actually a curse word in Portuguese. It's kind of like saying, you know, fuck, but it actually means like sperm. But it's just said like porra, like that's terrible. Or like empathetically, like someone goes, oh, I crashed my car. Oh, porra. They use it the exact same way we say fuck. Fuck, right. Fuck, man. But 
Paul Harder has taken on this slightly different thing, which is about going hard. Wait, these words are unrelated though, right? Yeah, but two but different words. It's two different meanings, but like- Just to, to clarify, because you might hear the other one. You might. And so you so you understand Paul Harder within the jujitsu context or how it's been popularized is it's not just like someone brawling, it's someone going at, at jujitsu super hard. Like it doesn't matter the grind, the hard work, like- you broke your wrist, strap it, pull harder. Like show up every day Fight. with a tough mentality. And look, it's, it's, it's noble in a lot of ways, but in truth, it, this is where we start to w- talk about working hard and working smart. Yes, you must work hard, but if you're getting injured on a regular basis, this is not going to lead to long-term jujitsu development. So uh, when we talk about overtraining, the, the flip side of that coin, like technically there's no, sing, no such thing as overtraining, but different people have different tolerance, tolerances for stress. So there is such thing as under recovering. If you're doing a certain amount of work and you, you're not sleeping, your nutrition is poor, you know, you, you're not doing any kind of body maintenance, stretching, massage, anything, you are cutting short your journey. Like you are railroading yourself into injury. So when we're talking about this comparison thing, sometimes people get are like, oh, that guy's training five days a week. I should train seven. And it's, that's not necessarily uh, the case. And this is where Joe actually has come up with the hashtag, some days poor harder. Yeah, look, the um, some days poor harder, it's, it's an important aspect of jiu-jitsu. You've got to be able to go hard. You've got to be able to fight, bring the aggression, bring the competitive aspect to it sometimes. But if you're doing that every day, you're going to burn yourself out. And th- this is the deal for most of the people I would argue that are listening to this, most of the people who are training jujitsu, and again, we framed this for like, you know, the things that I wish I knew as a white belt. So you're a white belt coming into this game. You're going to turn up to training a few times a week. Your coach is going to be like, hey man, I want to see you here every day. Like if you can get in here every day, like you're doing good. I was talking with a guy this morning. He said, oh, I only trained three times last week. I'm like, dude, I train like two to three times a week, every week like that. If you could maintain three sessions a week for the rest of your jiu-jitsu career, I think you're doing all right. Yeah, you're doing well. But he said, well, I like to do four to six. And I said, man, four to six is great. But if you are, this guy's in his late thirties. I'm like, you're working full time. You go out and party at least a few nights a week. You don't get as much sleep as you should. Your nutrition is, isn't as good as it should be. Like you're doing the things that most people out there are doing, like who are living a kind of urban lifestyle. So I'm like, it's unrealistic of you to think that you can show up and train hard four to six times a week and be able to sustain that. So the flips, you know, the result of that, not the flip side, but the result is that is, is that old mate always has to take time off because he's always getting injured. Uh, he's always burning out, not catching enough sleep. So he gets sick, catches a cold, something like that. It's like, dude, you are overtraining or under recovering, right? Yes. So fucking fix one of them. Either train less and sleep more yeah. or like start sleeping more, start eating better, start doing all that to stuff support it. so that you can train at that volume. And I think that the, the jujitsu culture is like, just train more, just show up, be on the mats more. And there is an element of like, yeah, showing up, even when you're tired, sometimes showing up is important, but you can't just keep like flogging that dead horse, uh, expecting to make progress forever. Yes, and I'm look. We're we're all on the same page with that, but I think the difficulty is some people are getting measured by attendance. So if they're trying to find that pathway up, they're thinking, oh, if I train more, coach will love me more. Oh, I can, you know, like I wanna, I wanna get my next belt. I wanna get my next strike.